Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 77, The Nail in the Coffin. This week we take a look at the reign of Frederick II in Germany from 1212 to 1220. Most of what he did was putting a nail in an actual coffin, while also putting the metaphorical nail into the carcass of imperial rule in Germany. And was that such a bad thing? What happens when the emperor just hands out what is left of the royal demesne? Cathedrals go up, princes hold splendid courts, and none of them think about disturbing the peace in Italy. If you are king of Sicily, that is a near-perfect result. And if you are the pope, even more so. In particular, when Frederick II throws in a brand new crusade and swears on all that is holy, that he would never, ever pursue a link-up between Sicily and the empire. Everybody happy? Well, let's see. Before we start, just a reminder, the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com. You'll find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Sharon, Q and John who've already signed up. Let's start and end this episode with Frederick II's relationship with the papacy, something we'll probably have to do in most upcoming episodes as well, so brace yourself. Frederick's trip to Germany had been sponsored, financially and politically, by his godfather, Pope Innocent III. Once Frederick had settled down north of the Alps, had been elected and gone through his first coronation, it was payback time. Payback happened in the shape of the golden bull of Eger. A golden bull is not a grown-up version of the golden calf that the Israelites danced around. It refers to a decree that he had received a special status thanks to the use of a golden seal, a bulla aurea. These golden bulls were rare and usually deserved for the most important decisions. The most famous of those was the golden bull of 1356 that set forth the constitution of the Holy Roman Empire, namely the institution of the seven electors. In short, in 1213, Frederick II issued a decree that was to be of the utmost importance. It consisted of three main commitments. First, that the crown gives up the right to the spolia, i.e. the right to receive the income from any bishopric that happened to be vacant after the incumbent's death. Second, Frederick gives up his rights to decide contested episcopal elections, and finally he recognises the Pope's right to central Italy, specifically to the Mark of Ancona and the Duchy of Spoleto. That is pretty much the end of the Concordat of Worms. The Church in Germany is now fully independent of the Emperor. All its resources can now be used as the bishops wish. All the generous donations in land and rights that the Ottonian Empress had made in the hope that these would remain at their disposal are lost to the crown for good. In 1216, when his role is fully established, Frederick was made to swear to these concessions again and had to get the imperial princes themselves to swear to them as well. He had to agree also to another condition. He had to abandon the crown of Sicily in favour of his son Henry so as to ensure that there would not be a union between the Holy Roman Empire and Sicily, a union that would encircle the Papal States. We all know by now what an oath is worth in 1216. At no point did Frederick II contemplate to put down the crown of Sicily. Southern Italy is his home. Even though he now styles himself as a Swabian grandson of Barbarossa, in truth, the only reason he came up to Germany in the first place was to protect Sicily from imperial invasions. He comes up with a cunning plan to outmaneuver the Pope. If he cannot be king of Sicily and emperor at the same time, well, let us see whether my son Henry can. Whilst he solemnly reaffirms all these commitments about not becoming king of Sicily anymore, he negotiates with the princes about electing young Henry as king of the Romans. And in December 1216, young Henry and Frederick's wife Constance of Aragon arrive in Nuremberg, and by 1220, after a lot of haggling, young Henry is elected and crowned. 
One reason Frederick gets away with such blatant disregard of his godfather is that this godfather died, quite unexpectedly, in 1216. Innocent III had been a young man by papal standards when he was elected, just 37 years old. He died on July 16, 1216, of a recurring malaria in Perugia. Sometimes the great defence mechanism of the papacy takes one of its own. Earlier that year he had presided over the Fourth Lateran Council, which must count as the absolute high point of medieval papal authority. Present were 400 bishops and archbishops from all corners of the Christian world. Even the patriarchs of Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch and Alexandria had come. 800 abbots and priors, as well as delegates of the emperors, both our Frederick, as well as the now Latin emperor of Constantinople, the kings of England, France, Aragon, Hungary, Cyprus and Jerusalem. The council promulgated 71 decrees covering a remarkably wide field. The doctrine of transubstantiation was defined in the first one of them. Number 13 forbade the formation of new religious orders, though the Dominicans were approved at that same council. The 18th abolished the use of boiling water and red-hot irons in trials by ordeal. The 21st insisted on confession and communion for all Catholics at least once a year at Easter. The 31st banned illegitimate sons of clergy taking over their father's churches. The last segments were directed against the Jews. No Christian was to have commerce with Jewish lenders. Both Jews and Muslims had to wear distinctive dress and were not allowed to be seen in public during Holy Week. But at least, it did not call for their expulsion or destruction. That was reserved to the heretics, namely the Albigensians or Cathars of southwest France. The Fourth Lateran Council granted any knight who would be prepared to undertake the tough job of slaughtering peasants a free ticket to paradise. The overarching theme of the council was, however, the recapture of the holy sites in Palestine. The Crusader state still clung on to the coastline, but despite several attempts, including a huge Third Crusade, Jerusalem was still in Muslim hands. And after the catastrophe that was the Fourth Crusade, Pope Innocent III did even contemplate to take a Crusader army to Outremer himself. As the true emperor that he saw himself, that was just a natural conclusion. A date for the crusade was set for 1217, and a special tax was levied on all bishops and cardinals to fund the expedition. The project collapsed, obviously, with the death of Innocent III. Though Innocent III was probably the most powerful medieval pope, his remains did not get treated with the respect they deserved. The night after his death, the house he had died in was raided and his body stolen. It was found the next morning, stripped naked in the street, rapidly decomposing in the heat. The citizens of Perugia buried him hastily. It is said that his bones ended up being mixed up with those of Urban IV and Martin IV in a box that was kept in a drawer in the cathedral sacristy. In the 19th century, Leo XIII ordered that the bones should be brought to Rome to be buried in a splendid tomb in St. John Lateran. A priest was dispatched to pick them up. Innocent III came back to Rome by train in a simple suitcase. Brief and empty is the deceptive glory of this world, is what Jacques de Vitry said when he saw the Pope's naked body in the street. Innocent III's successor was Honorius III, a much older man, and as it happens, a former tutor of Frederick in his very early years. We'll get back to Honorius towards the end of this episode, when he will perform the imperial coronation in Rome. Now the Pope is, as we now know, only one of the trifecta of Horus an emperor has to deal with. The other two are the imperial princes and the Italian communes. Now we'll get to the communes in one of the next episodes, so today we only have the imperial princes. The way Frederick dealt with them was a combination of exalted ritual and plain bribery. Bribery was the way Philip and Otto IV had competed for the crown and Frederick just continued and accelerated the process. Other than Philip, he had never seen a different model of how to manage the Holy Roman Empire, and none of the princes would have told him otherwise. And there's also a question whether there was a road back to the governance of the first years of Barbarossa's reign. The idea that an emperor could rally his princes behind him with the promise of the riches of Italy had died from dysentery before the walls of Rome in 1167. 
Even Frederick's grandfather had replaced the policy of centralizing royal power with the policy to strengthen the territorial power of the Hohenstaufen family. Nevertheless, Frederick's level of generosity was unprecedented. In particular, given that his rival, Otto IV, was utterly defeated, and by 1218, also utterly dead. Everybody got what they wanted. Even poor Walter von der Vogelweide, the itinerant Minnesänger, finally gets his fief that allows him to live in relative comfort. The most generous donation, though, goes to the bishops. In 1220, Frederick agrees to the Confederatio Cum Principis Ecclesiasticis, a very long word for the total abandonment, or if even the last remaining vestiges of royal power in ecclesiastical lands. He hands over the right to mint coins and raise duties on the rivers, wholesale to all the bishops. These are the most financially valuable rights of the crown. The right to mint coins does not just involve the ability to physically stamp them, but also includes the right to determine which coins are legal tender in a territory. And that can be really lucrative. The tradition was to declare certain coins invalid as of a particular day and require the inhabitants of the territory to swap them for either smaller number or inferior coins. The prince or king would then pocket the difference. That may help filling the pockets of the bishops in the short term, but had a devastating long-term impact on the economy. Constant devaluation or replacement of the currency creates uncertainty and makes transactions much riskier. In England, the kings did not resort to such policies. The English pound remained fairly stable throughout the Middle Ages, despite occasional royal bankruptcies, one of the many reasons for England surpassing Germany in terms of prosperity during this period. Granting the right to levy duties on river and road transport was even more devastating for the German economy. The Rhine River is the natural link between northern and southern Europe. It is navigable from Rotterdam to Basel. From there, it's only 400 kilometers to Milan across Alpine passes, or 250 kilometers overland to Chalon, where one can pick up the Rhone River again and sail down to Marseille. It is the natural transport artery of Europe. Today, the transport volume on Rhine, Mosel, Main, and Neckar is six times that of all French navigable rivers. Nevertheless, by the 15th century, the cities from Reims to Lyon matched or exceeded the economic power of the German cities along the Rhine. And that had to do with the ability of all sorts of princes with access to the river to demand duties. On top of that came the Stapelrecht, the right to demand that any passing merchant had to offer his wares at market in the town he passed. The Rhine was still a great way to transport things from north to south, but it had to fight with one arm tied behind its back. You cannot blame all that on Frederick II, whose room to manoeuvre was limited, and who may not fully understand the economic implications. Though his grandfather did at some point cut down the duty posts along the Rhine and Main River to facilitate trade, so maybe Frederick could have understood that in part. In his beloved Sicily, we will see him deploying much more beneficial policies. So detractors may claim... He simply did not care. Generosity towards the princes was one part of Frederick's governance model. The other was the power of rituals. We've already seen how Barbarossa had tried to wow his contemporaries with the imperial diet of Pentecost 1184, and how Philip of Swabia used splendid feasts as a way to bring wavering princes over to his side. Frederick turbocharged these events by leveraging potent symbols to legitimize his regime. The first of these elaborate ceremonies took place in 1213, so before the Battle of Bovin and so before Frederick's rise to undisputed power. He had the remains of his uncle Philip, who had been murdered and then quickly buried in Bamberg, dug up and laid to rest in the Cathedral of Speyer. Speyer was the Saint-Denis of Germany, the place where the emperors are buried. Once the greatest and most splendid of church buildings in Western Europe next to Cluny, It was the German metropolis, as the chroniclers called it. Now remember, the family of Barbarossa never called themselves the Hohenstaufen. They saw themselves as the descendants of the Henrys of Weiblingen, the dynasty we call the Salians. Hence, the Salian burial place in Speyer, built by Conrad II and Henry IV, was their family mausoleum. That was true even though until 1213 no Hohenstaufen ruler had been buried in Speyer. 
Frederick Barbarossa's remains had been lost in Palestine. Henry VI was buried in Palermo and Conrad III, well, Conrad III nobody really talks about. He was also in Bamberg, by the way, in a long-forgotten corner. The women of the family were buried in Speyer, though. Beatrice, the wife of Barbarossa and the grandmother of Frederick, was there as well as her daughter Agnes. By staging a great reburial of the murdered Hohenstaufen king, his uncle, in the burial ground of the old empress, Frederick II establishes a link between himself and the splendor of the empire of old. He, the child of Pulle, is lifted to the true heir of the kingdom. Not quite the same as the revelation of Aragorn of Gondor. Same idea. The true king is back. The next big set piece is linked to the coronation. You remember that his first coronation in Mainz was a bit haphazard. In 1215, after Otto IV had lost the Battle of Bovin, this could be remedied. Aachen had been firmly within the territory controlled by Otto IV, but when Frederick II took an army up north along the Rhine, the Welf allies came across one by one, even Otto's father-in-law, the Duke of Brabant. The city of Aachen opened its gates and Frederick entered in all his splendor. What followed was the full medieval coronation ceremony inside Charlemagne's Palatine Chapel. The chapel not only held the fabled throne of Charlemagne that Frederick ascended, but it was also lit by the enormous Barbarossa chandelier, symbolizing the new Jerusalem, made from gilded copper 4.2 meters in diameter and hanging off a 27-meter chain. But that is not the only relic that Barbarossa had left behind for him. In 1165, Barbarossa had arranged for his antipope to elevate Charlemagne to be a saint. The Holy Roman Empire still lacked a saint at the time. The Hungarians had Saint Stephen, Norwegians had Saint Olaf, the English had Edward the Confessor. Charlemagne was to become a symbol of the divinity, holiness of the empire, independent from papal authority. No surprise then that the official church never acknowledged the sainthood of Charlemagne. As part of the sanctification of Charlemagne, Barbarossa had his grave opened and his bones put into a temporary casket. Ever since then, the debate had raged about how to properly honour the greatest of all the emperors. Finally, Otto IV had commissioned the metal workers of Maastricht and Aachen to create a splendid golden shrine, almost as large and almost as splendid as the Three Kings Reliquary in Cologne. By the time it was finished, Bouvines had happened and Aachen had fallen to Frederick. So two days after his coronation, and on the first anniversary of the Battle of Bouvines, Frederick had the remains of Charlemagne solemnly translated into its final resting place. Once the lid had been put over the golden shrine, the king took off his royal mantle, mounted the scaffold together with the master of works, and personally nailed the coffin shut. With this almost intimate act, he declared not just his veneration for the saint, but also his personal, familial connection. He is the pious son who gives rest to his great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, reaffirming his membership to that everlasting imperial dynasty that traces back to Julius Caesar and ultimately ancient Troy. We may grin at this ham-fisted historical fabrication, but the medieval world swallowed it hook, line and sinker. There were over a hundred locations across the empire where Charlemagne was venerated as a saint. The shrine alone is more than worth travelling to Aachen for, so really, if you have a chance, do it. What I find fascinating is the iconography. First, on the front, we see Charlemagne enthroned, flanked by two smaller figures, those of Pope Leo and the Archbishop of Reims, i.e. the emperor on this shrine is bigger than the pope. Then, on the sides, we would normally find apostles and prophets. We have depictions of emperors and kings. Chronologically, we have Louis the Pious, Lothar, Charles the Fat, one unknown emperor, Zwentibol, the king of Lothringia, Henry the Fowler, Otto I to III, Henry II, Henry III, Henry IV, Henry V, Henry VI, Otto IV, and Frederick II. There are some really surprising absences. So no Louis the German, the one who founded East Francia. Instead, we have Lothar and Zwentibold, rulers of Lotharingia, of which, remember, Aachen was a part. So this is not a German shrine. The next absence is Conrad II, maybe an oversight. Conrad III, 
because really, I mean, it seems everybody forgotten about him. And then there's Lothar the Third, at least grandfather of Otto the Fourth, who you know, after all, paid for the whole thing. That's a bit odd. But then the most confusing omission is Barbarossa himself. Why is he not there when Otto the Fourth is? Now, given that Frederick the Second himself is on it, and Otto the Fourth almost certainly has not put him on. The piece must have been reworked in the months before Frederick had entered Aachen. So why not remodel Otto IV into Barbarossa? If all this is about the everlasting Stauffer dynasty, why having the interloper there? It is a mystery. The Karl Shrine is one of the absolute high points in European medieval goldsmith art, together with the Shrine of Mary, which is also in Aachen, and the slightly older Three Kings reliquary in Cologne. In these years, following the Battle of Bovine, Europe experiences a period of incredible artistic flourishing. We already talked about the troubadours and the Minnesänger, whose most productive period is between 1190 and 1230. Many of the great medieval epics were written down and finalized in this period. Parsifal, Tristan and Isolde, Nibelungen, Dietrich von Bern, and one of my favorite, the story of Duke Ernst. You remember episode 23? In architecture, we are transitioning from the Romanesque to the Gothic. The first Gothic church had been Saint-Denis near Paris and was begun under the abbot Suger in 1135. In 1207, the Cathedral of Magdeburg, the great church erected by Otto the Great, had burned down. Its replacement was to become the first German Gothic church. It was followed shortly after by the cathedrals of Bamberg and Naumburg, where German artists and craftsmen excelled were the sculptures decorating these new Gothic cathedrals. There is the statue of St. Maurice in Magdeburg, the first realistic depiction of an African man since Roman times. The great figures of the founders of Naumburg Cathedral, which include the gorgeous Uta von Ballenstedt, and the greatest of them all, the intriguing Bamberg Horseman, the first monumentally questioning statue since antiquity, depicting, well, we do not know who. Some say it's Frederick II, but could equally be in Henry II, Imre of Hungary, or a saint, if not the Messiah. The funding of these great works came at least in part from the incredibly generous donations Frederick had to do to keep the imperial princes on side. By 1220, Frederick feels he'd spent enough time and enough money in Germany, eight years overall. The realm north of the Alps is at peace. His legitimacy is recognized by all, all that generosity had also allowed him to have his son Henry elected and consecrated as king. The next inevitable step is the coronation as emperor in Rome, and that required the agreement of the Pope. And as I said, this episode begins and ends with the relationship between Pope and Emperor. Innocent III had died in 1216. His successor, Honorius III, was a much more consideratory man. He was a lot older and more of an administrator than a visionary. That does not mean he lacked political objectives, but other than innocent, he lacked the ambition to achieve all of them at once. Honorius cared above all others about one thing, regaining Jerusalem. For that objective, he was willing to overlook many a thing. In 1215, at his coronation in Aachen, Frederick did not only ascend the throne of Charlemagne and nailed his coffin shut, he also emulated him a third time, by taking the cross. The notion of what constitutes a crusade had gradually shifted, from the liberation of the Holy Sepulchre to sort of more general war on Muslims and pagans. And as a consequence, Charlemagne's brutal raid on the pagan Saxons was recast as a crusade, a crusade even before crusades were a thing. So when Frederick took the cross in 1215, he did that to elevate his standing as future emperor, as a descendant and follower of Charlemagne, not as a faithful son of the church. That is why Innocent III largely ignored it and called his own crusade at the Fourth Lateran Council, a crusade he planned to lead himself without any material involvement of the emperor. Honorius III, as I said, was less ambitious. He embraced Frederick's commitment to take the cross. It is probably also in this context that Honorius accepted the election of little Henry as king of the Romans, alongside his title as king of Sicily. 
he must have realized that this would mean, at least over time, a union between the Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of Sicily, in other words, the encirclement of the states of the Church. But it seems Honorius III could accept that, as long as it was a long time in the future. When Frederick himself arrives in Rome before the Porta Colina on November 22, 1220, he promises again that he would never seek a union between the Empire and Sicily, and only then is he admitted to the Holy City. From the gate he rides in procession behind the prelates and cardinals of Rome to Old St. Peter. He enters the atrium, a space that, like Old St. Peter itself, no longer exists. In there stood on one side the enormous sarcophagus of Otto II, also now relocated and replaced. On the other is Santa Maria dei Turi, rebuilt after his grandfather had so sacrilegiously destroyed the predecessor church. Here he swears all the oaths of fealty and obedience to the Pope his predecessors had sworn before him. Upon entering the basilica itself, he's made a canon of St. Peter, in other words he's now a priest able to administer sacraments. He's anointed by Ugolino, the cardinal bishop of Ostia, who had also anointed Otto IV just 11 years earlier. Ugolino was a nephew of Innocent III and would later become Pope Gregory IX. The climax of the ceremony comes when Frederick receives the imperial robes, the orb, the scepter and the crown from the Pope himself at the altar of St. Peter. Amongst the great imperial garments are now these wonderful items brought across from Palermo. The imperial coronation mantle, the totally over-the-top imperial gloves and most importantly the imperial socks. I will put pictures of all of these and the sculptures I mentioned before on the episode webpage. Take a look. The link is in the show notes. Now, after all that, the Pope celebrates Mass, at which the Emperor, having taken his clothes off again, assists him as if he was a junior priest. At last, Frederick pledges to take the cross and receives the Crusader's robes, again from the Cardinal Bishop of Ostia. Leaving St. Peter, the Pope mounts his horse again, helped by the Emperor who holds his stirrups. Frederick then performs the service of Strator, and leads the Pope's horse over an unknown distance. My God, has this changed from the days of Otto the Great? The Emperor is made to bow and assist and kneel and reaffirm the supremacy of the Pope so often, it almost looks as if the Pope is crowned, not the Emperor. Remember the fallout between Barbarossa and the Pope over the Strator service? Feels like a long, long time ago. In the Middle Ages, these ceremonies were supposed to mean an awful lot. It used to be that the displayed reality became truth through the mere act of its performance. An emperor leading the Pope's horse like a groom became a groom to the Pope. But we're also coming to the end of the true medieval period, which means that oaths and rituals are still performed and intended to convey reality. But the truth is that oaths are being broken and rituals no longer protect from political realities. Next week, we'll see what Frederick does with his newly acquired imperial crown and crusading pledge. Suffice to say that oaths will be broken, political necessities will overturn richly confirmed relationships, but that's not all. Frederick will set out on crusade despite being excommunicated, will be successful without a shot being fired, and still, well, I hope you will join us again. Before I go, let me thank all of you supporting the show, in particular the patrons who have so kindly signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans. It is thanks to you that this show does not have to do advertising for mattresses or energy supplements, pension plans, and all sorts of other goodies. If Patreon isn't for you, another way to help the show is sharing the podcast directly or boosting its recognition on social media. If you share, comment, or retweet a post from the History of the Germans, it is more likely to be seen by others, hence bringing in more listeners. My most active places are Twitter, at Germans History, and my Facebook page, History of the Germans Podcast. As always, all the links are in the show notes.